Okay. Um, so I wanted to, I mean, because this, this isn't just going to go out to a neuroscience or even a electrophysiologist background, so I wanted to talk just briefly about what ion channels are and why they're so important and maybe why they fascinated you so much over your, your life in science. Hmm. Well, my wife has been known to say at parties when asked what I did, she said she he works on little holes in rat muscle, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, not a terribly helpful way to put it. You want me to start right at the beginning? Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Well, nerves work by the passage of electric currents through membranes, and so does the transmission from one nerve to the next nerve, or from a nerve to a muscle fibre. But the membranes are insulators, they're fatty stuff which won't pass an electric current, so they have to have special pores in the membrane which, which will allow the current to pass, and these are made of protein and they're called ion channels because the current is carried by the flow of sodium or potassium or calcium ions, not, not by electrons, it's in metal. Mm -hmm. And um, in order for them to function, these channels have to be controlled somehow. They can't just, just being permanently open wouldn't help. But um, if we're talking about a nerve impulse conduction, then the channels are controlled by the potential difference across the membrane, the voltage. When that changes, the channel will open. Now, the timing is such that um, that allows a nerve impulse to propagate down a nerve. In the case of transmission from a nerve to a muscle fiber, for example, that's carried out in a, by means of a chemical which is released from the end of the motor nerve, the nerve coming from your brain, and that chemical causes the opening of ion channels in the, in the membrane of the muscle. And that changes the voltage across the muscle fiber will cause an impulse to propagate down the muscle fibre and the muscle fibre will then contract. Perfect. <laughs> um, so when did your interest, I mean I, I kind of semi already know these things anyway, but when did your interest in ion channels begin? Or did I, because I know that it sort of came out accidentally from work that you were doing. Statistically I thought, um, or maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick. No, well, not really. It was like most things that control your fate. It was pretty much accident. Mm -hmm. um, for the first five years I was at UCL, six years, I wasn't, didn't get very far experimentally. I was trying to apply the equations for competitive antagonism to the combination of, to, to the action of um, an antibody sensitizing a, a cell and the competition with a non-specific antibody for, for, the, for the binding sites. But I spent five years and I've really got <laughs> nowhere with it because the equilibration is much too slow, they're very high affinity. Was that PhD or, or postdoc? No, this was, this was postdoc. Mm -hmm. Look, for, for my PhD I'd been trying, I'd, my job was to measure the binding of labelled antibodies, which mm -hmm. in the early 1960s was a very novel idea. <laughs> And uh, it didn't work, uh, despite the fact that we'd come across two different antibodies, one of which would sensitize the cells and one which wouldn't, but were otherwise very similar. Mm -hmm. So we had a perfect control. But when we measured the binding of these to bits of ground up lung in this instance, you couldn't tell any difference. There was just too much non-specific binding. Mm -hmm. This was being done at the same time as my friend Humphrey Rang in Oxford was doing his PhD on the binding of labelled atropine to muscle fibres and there he did find a specific component of binding so he thoroughly beat me <laughs> <laughs> in that instance. But wh while doing that I was writing a textbook on statistics and the then head of the de department Heinz Schilt had uh, written a paper about 2 plus 2 dose biological assays while he was interned during the war. Mm -hmm. 
subsequently naturalized, but because he was one of the very many physiologists and pharmacologists in, at that time and spoke with strong German accents, having been of refugees course, yeah. from Nazism. All, almost all the senior physiologists and pharmacologists at that period were that in that category. We gained phenomenal mm -hmm. history in that way. Uh, and he, he was a very nice man, and I think I got a job here because I was able to teach people about the statistics of the 2 plus 2 dose biological assay, which he was very keen to do. It would be considered far too advanced for pharmacology students these days. Mm -hmm. um, there would be all sorts of complaints if you tried to do that, I'm sure. But I, I, I did it to the best of my abilities, and I got so interested I started to write a textbook on statistics, which is all about, uh, about all that came out of my first time. It's a handful of papers. Lectures on statistics. But, but the book came out. I'd have been fired these days for sure. <laughs> Not productive enough. <laughs> Not bringing in enough money. Um, and actually, as my friend Humphrey Rangman came to the rescue, he said maybe it would be a good thing if you had a change and went to the States. So I did a rather late postdoc in the States with my poor mother, Richie. Mm -hmm. He's dead now, but he was exceedingly active then. He was chair of the pharmacology department in Yale. The flying Scotsman. He's from Aberdeen and just didn't have a trace of a, an American accent, even though he'd been there for 25 years at the time. And he's actually a maths graduate. Now, he, his maths wasn't particularly good, actually. My, my maths was all self taught, but it was rather better than his <laughs> by that time. But he was working on iron channels, sodium channels, and we tried to measure the, the binding of labelled saxitoxin to sodium channels to count them because he wasn't known that And we thought we'd succeeded, though, in retrospect. It turned out that we had the specific activity of the label saxitoxin wrong by a factor of three or so, so they were very accurate estimates in the end. But it was great fun, and it got me interested in iron channels. Mm -hmm. I tried to measure the affinity of saxitoxin from functional measurements, which is not entirely straightforward for a, a, a voltage activated channel like a sodium channel. If it was a drug activated receptor we could use the Schilt method, the Schilt equation, mm -hmm. which was devised by my <coughs> my boss, Andrew Schilt. Uh, but for voltage activated channels where there's no agonist there, it wasn't uh, entirely clear how to do it. And yet what we did was a sort of pseudo shield experiment where you measure the um, the, eff the effect of the toxin at different sodium concentrations but it's not the same as, as a proper shield equation so I there was a chap in the physiology department in Yale called Knox Chandler who's been very eminent worked in Cambridge in fact where he's American and um he had a box of punch cards which calculated the Hodgkin-Huxley action potential on the mainframe IBM that Yale had. So he was able to simulate this just by changing the number of sodium channels in the model. Mm -hmm. And we came up with a number which was, in, in the end, was proved quite accurate for the binding affinity of the toxin. Mm -hmm. So that, that got me quite interested in iron channels. And then you came back to UCR, or...? Well, yes. And... I was very interested in iron channels, but uh, also a huge admirer of Bernard Katz, who was very active. He, at the beginning of the 70s, when I was in the States, he devised noise analysis, uh, which involved putting a concentration of agonist on these ligand-gated iron channels. So, quite a low concentration, so maybe a thousand were open. Mm -hmm. 
very small, but nobody knew how small. Mm -hmm. And when when there's only a thousand open, you have to. It, it's not a thousand, not exactly a thousand all the time, because each individual iron channel is opening and shutting at random. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a thousand plus or minus. Um, well, the square root of a thousand. You know, and you can calculate, you can actually see this variability of the number of channels that are open from moment to moment. And, you know, you spend most of your time in electrophysiology trying to get rid of the noise. And the cats have noticed that if you turn up the amplification, that the, the, no the noisiness of the channel, the random wiggles, were much bigger when the agonist was there than when it wasn't. And he said, well, this must just be the random fluctuations in the number of iron channels. And by a bit of pretty simple mathematics, you can get from those random fluctuations the number of iron channels and therefore the conductance of each individual iron channel. And that was the first time that had ever been known. So I thought this was, this was really riveting. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what had been assumed up to that point? What sort of ideas were postulated that the iron channels were carriers or, or or that each ion channel acted like the macroscopic current or the or um, was there not much postulated no no the word, the word ion channel was barely known at that time but Katz and Paul Fatton the bi people in the biophysics department had been describing them as aqueous pores mm -hmm. for quite a long time because they realised that there was too much current to be carried by a carrier, which is rather slow and low capacity. So the idea that there were aqueous pores, or um, now we call them iron channels, was already well in existence at that time. It just wasn't known how much would flow through, through one of them. But the assumption underlying the noise analysis was that the, the channel was just open and shut at random. Mm -hmm using sort of rectangular pulses. Uh, the noisiness of the measured signal was too big to see the individual ones opening and shutting, but you could infer it indirectly from the noise, and that was a terrific trick. Mm -hmm. And um, did some experiments on noise analysis in Southampton at that stage um, with acetyl monoethylcholine. That would be rang at Chemnay if you put monoethylcholine in the medium <coughs> it can be taken up as choline would be and it'll synthesize monoethylcholine in the nerve ending just like the natural synthetic processes and uh, that could be released as a transmitter as a false transmitter mm -hmm. and you could measure synaptic currents you know, synaptic currents produced by this false transmitter or so it was presumed, but in order to be sure of that, you needed to know what the signal produced by acetyl monoethylcholine would look like. And by applying a steady concentration of monoethylcholine and measuring the noise, you could infer how long each channel stayed open for on average, as well as its conductance. If you used uh, a noise spectrum and uh, the uh, intensity of the noise plotted against frequency, you could infer indirectly how long it would take for this synaptic current to decay, and it agreed quite well with the observed decay, so that suggested that indeed my acetyl monoethylcholine was being released. That was my venture into noise analysis. We didn't have a computer that in, in this stage of 1973-ish that would calculate this, but I'm, being in Southampton was rather useful because they had an Institute of Sound and Vibration Research in Southampton, which was really very eminent in its field. Mm -hmm. And they had computers that would work out fast Fourier transforms and spit out a, a power spectrum. Uh, but this big FM tape recorder down the road to the Institute of Sound and Vibration was there. What I hadn't known until later, 
was that during the time I was away in Yale, 70 to 72, Bernard Katz had had a, a young postdoc called Bert Sackman. <laughs> and they had been talking in the wake of noise analysis whether it might ever be possible to measure the current just through one of these channels. And to do that, you had to improve the signal to noise ratio by at least a factor of a thousand. <laughs> that, that sounded like an almost impossible task. But when Bert Sackman went back to, to Göttingen, he, he had a friend there called Erwin Nea. Nea, in Dieter Lux's lab, had been experimenting with reducing the noise of a signal by recording from the very small patch of membrane. You see, you could use Vaseline to produce only a small patch of membrane, and they realized that the noisiness of the signal depended uh, predominantly on the capacitance of the object that you were um, measuring from. And if you're measuring from a whole cell, it's quite big. But if you can measure from a very small area, uh, then the, it would be much quieter. So what they do, instead of making sharp electrodes which you penetrate the cell with, as we always had, they made blunt ones which they put on the outside of the cell without puncturing the membrane but would just isolate just a, something of the order of a square micrometer of membrane under the tip of the pipette. And um, that allowed them to record the first picture of a single iron channel in a biological membrane, uh, which was published in 1976. Well, I mean, this is wonderful. <laughs> because it fitted exactly in with my statistical interests. Uh, for the reason, the reason for that being that you record from one molecule, it's a random signal, you don't get smooth, smooth curves, you just get steps up, down, up, down, uh, and your job is to interpret them, I thought this was, this was really terrific. On top of which, we had already worked out with um, a statistician colleague, Alan Hawkes, that if you could measure these things, might be possible to solve the binding gating problem. It's something that's uh, obsessed me all my life. <laughs> um, the point is that if a protein changes conformation and something binds, which is what an agonist does, um, how can you tell whether if you change to a different agonist and that agonist is more potent, how can you tell whether it's more potent because it binds better in the first place or because having bound it changes, it, it produces a more efficient response per molecule bound. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a very old uh, pharmacological, well very old, 1950s pharmacological problem. Uh, a chap called Stevenson who was around when I was doing my PhD in Edinburgh. So I knew him. I'd written a paper in 1956 where he called these two things affinity and efficacy. Affinity being the ability to bind in the first place, and efficacy being the ability to produce a response once the molecule was bound. And clearly, if you want to do any rational structure activity relationships, if you change the structure and the potency changes, you want to know whether that's because the affinity has changed or whether it's because the efficacy has changed. And Stevenson, his successor, especially Robert Firthgott, had produced elaborate ways of measuring these things, which were actually all entirely wrong. They, 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 they just didn't work. It took me till 1987 to notice why they didn't work. And I published it in a book which is quite obscure. And it seems to be ignored by very many people. I think if you went into the average pharmacology department, you would be lucky to find a single person who understands properly the binding gating problem. I wrote a review about it in 1998, which is, which I thought, what's the point of writing a review about this? It's all known. <laughs> but apparently not, because it's had a lot of citations. <laughs> and. Um, but I, I could see that one method that might work, if you were lucky, was single iron channel. And 
we produced entirely theoretical predictions, tunnels wouldn't open sort of singly, but they'd open in little bursts. They'd really be open a couple of times before they shut. And we were unable to find any sort of physically plausible numbers that didn't result in a prediction of this sort. And if you could measure these reopenings, then you could separate out affinity and efficacy, you know, binding and gating. And that was, that was uh, that's a terrific prospect, because if you combine the the interest in ion channels with the interest in pharmacological principles. So um, I got together with Bert Sackman and we, we made the first measurements of that sort. In Göttingen? In Göttingen, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, pro probably my <laughs> most original paper ever. Though, with the help of colleagues right here, uh, my part was relatively small. Mm -hmm. I think we improved on that in 2008. It took 50 years, actually, before we improved on the <laughs> original work, on, on the original um, Bernie Katz proposals. Because mm -hmm. all the work up to 2004, anyway, had been based on the idea that there's just a sort of single... Think in existence only two conformations and either shut or it's open, mm -hmm. like hemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. But back in 1957, um, Bernard Katz had essentially spotted the binding gating problem because he said, you know, it's just the simplest possible way it could work is if there's a binding step and then there's a gating step. They have to exist three states altogether. Mm -hmm vacant, occupied, and open. It's an iron channel. And that was essentially affinity and efficacy, except it was put in terms of a very simplified model rather than an abstract concept. Uh, and although the papers were published within a year of each other, they were completely unaware of each other's work. They were in different sort of stratospheres. Um, but In 2004, uh, with Luke Cifalotti and Remedius Lappe, I suppose he said, <laughs> um, he found some quite convincing evidence, convinces me anyway, that there's actually an intermediate state between the resting one and the open confirmation. And that resting state is a sort of local confirmation chain that's produced round the binding site. And one and which, which is uh, quite local, but it's only from that state that the channel can then flip and open. Mm -hmm. And in, in that was in 2004 with the glycine channel, which is actually better than the nicotinic channel for looking at these things. The muscle type nicotinic receptors might be mostly worked on up till then. Um, with the glycine channel, you could see this relatively clearly. And The obvious question for a pharmacologist was that if you have a partial agonist, does that reduce the opening and shutting reaction, the actual efficacy reaction, or does it reduce the ability to change from the resting state to this intermediate state? Mm -hmm. And Remedius Lappe did experiments, first with glycine, but then with nicotinic as well. And the results were uh, <laughs> really very intriguing because they showed that even the very weakest partial agonists, things like choline, which open about 1% of the receptors or something at maximum, um, the actual open-shut reaction was just the same for that as for a full agonist. And the reason they were partial was this preliminary confirmation chain. So that was the other exciting period of my life in two years. Which is not like so a, lot of, a lot of people get none at all. <laughs> and and uh, it was really quite striking. And it, it makes a lot of sense because you know, the, the, the open the gate that opens and shuts, the actual vitamin pore which changes shape to allow ions to flow through it is quite long, quite buried in the membrane and quite a long way from the binding site. 
are outside the membrane. Uh, so how, how do they know which agonist molecule is bound, whether it's full or partial? Um, well, I think the answer is they don't. They, uh, the, uh, the confirmation, the local confirmation change produced near the binding site, which does recognize the difference between the different molecules, um, and differs in its ability to produce this intermediate state from which opening can occur. And of course, if they don't produce much of it, there won't be many openings. Mm -hmm. But the openings themselves will occur at just the same rate and for the same length of time as, as, as the full agonist. And that was, that was sort of riveting to me. Mm -hmm. Have, I, I, in, in my knowledge we haven't, but um, perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, have we got to the same level of understanding of other receptors and is it even possible to come to the same level of understanding of other receptors with the methods that we have at the moment? For example, the AMPA receptor desensitizes very quickly and for a long time. Um, so does that mean that it's beyond the realms of these sort of studies to fully understand the mechanisms of an AMPA receptor? Or? AMPA receptors are difficult for signal channel studies because they have quite low conductance, so you don't get very good resolution. Okay. But no, it, it, some progress has been made with AMPA at the single channel level, and it's not impossible that it could reach the same level of resolution in the end uh, as, um, as the glycine and nicotinic channels, which are the ones that have been used most. But of course, the most numerous class of receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. Mm -hmm. And that in one sense, quite a lot is known about them. There are better X-ray structures of them than there are of ion channels. There's a lot known about the transduction mechanisms, but nobody has ever solved the binding gating problem. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what the separate affinity and efficacy are. And the reason for that is because the response is always measured well downstream of the initial events. You know, so they change in cyclic AMP or something. Mm -hmm. But what you can't do is measure the confirmation change in the receptor itself. And uh, that's what you would need to be able to do to, to come up with conclusions of the solidity that exists for iron channels. Maybe someone will find a way of doing it when people have had Nobel Prizes for the, um, for the developments in, in key protein coupled receptors. But, um, from the quantitative point of view, they're mildly mild behind them. Behind agonist activated ion channels. Uh, and the single channel method is is pretty astonishing because if you because you can measure so much from a set of ion single ion channel records, they don't look very promising, but they have a huge amount of information. If you measure a, a macroscopic current one with many ion channels that are averaged you might be able to measure two exponentials most, for example. So you, that's, you can measure three arbitrary parameters, the time constants for the two exponentials and their relative amplitude. From a set of single channel records at its optimum, if everything is just right, you can measure 18 free parameters mm -hmm. simultaneously. That's far more than you can get and pretty routinely you can measure 10 or 12 or 14 even. That's far more than you can get from any macroscopic experiment, and that's part of the appeal. Mm -hmm. In fact, all of the 80s and 90s were occupied with improving the, uh, the analysis methods for them. My brilliant statistician friend, 1990 and 92 found a way of correcting exactly for the fact that you don't see very fast events in your record. Mm -hmm. uh, this sounds trivial, but it's, it's actually not. Uh, you're seeing channel openings, but there are little interruptions in them. It's quite brief. Uh, they're so brief that often the recording equipment will not register their existence. Um, so the record you measure is censored. It doesn't contain brief times. 
mostly brief shut times and, and brief open ones as well, just get missed. So what you want to know for the purposes of fitting your model for these records is not so much the predicted distribution of open times, but the predicted distribution of apparent open times, apparent meaning mm -hmm. uh, they'll, they'll be longer than the real open times because some of them will contain one or more missed shuttings. And this had been formulated mathematically in the 1980s, but everybody said there was no closed solution to this mathematical problem. The Laplace transform that described it was not invertible explicitly. Uh, but Alan Hawkes found a way in 1990, which was wonderful. And then two years later, they found an exceedingly good approximation because the exact solution he'd found becomes numerically very cumbersome if it's a long time interval. But they found an asymptotic form that holds beautifully. So it's much more complicated to calculate than the simple open time or simple mm -hmm. burst length. In fact, the mug of the course we then has a, uh, an equation in matrix form for the distribution of the length of a burst of openings. Right, and that's uh, a burst of openings there with some interruptions in it. But that's the ideal equation. That's what happens if you can measure everything you've got missing things. Um, so that's the simple version. And this is a relatively short equation and easy to evaluate if you know matrix notation. I've always been very pleased with that burst length equation because it's one of the few times I beat Alan Hawkes to inverting the Laplace transform. Um, uh, but um, it, it's not actually usable <laughs> for analysis of real records because it doesn't allow for missed events. The whole thing becomes a lot more complicated when you do allow for missed events. But um, Alan Hawkes worked it out and I programmed it so we have a working program which will will do the analysis and see how well different postulated models, mechanisms will describe the data you've got. And if they describe it well, then you can get good estimates of the, uh, of the rate constants for the transitions between different states. Once you know them, you can calculate anything about the receptor, mm -hmm. how it will behave in a synapse and so on. Mm -hmm. And thus create models and build up from there. Possibly. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, neuroscience in general. Um, but first of all, do you consider yourself a neuroscientist? Would you ever describe no. yourself as a neuroscientist? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> a pharmacologist. A, a pharmacologist or a biophysicist. I okay. Accept neuroscientist. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> do things in neuroscience excite you other than ion channels or is your blog would have me believe that it's too littered with problems to... What excites you about neuroscience and what um, irritates you about neuroscience or science generally? It's all up here, Bernard Katz said it. Um, in the, into the final words of his inaugural lecture, which he gave in 1952, I think. That's why I don't know. My time is up. I'm very glad I am because I have been leading myself right up to a domain on which I should not dare to trespass, not even in an inaugural lecture. This domain contains the awkward problems of mind and matter about so, about which so much has been talked and so little can be said. And what year was that? Sorry. Uh, it was 1950. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, apart from anything else, it's masterly English for somebody who didn't spoke any German until he came to this country. Didn't speak any English. He spoke, he spoke German. Yeah, but his English was, was very, very good. Mm -hmm. Actually, the best English in the lab is usually spoken by non-English people. In my yeah, that's experience. funny. In my lab in Bristol, the um, the best English speaker was a Russian. I have to say, <laughs> the, and the most yeah. literary, literary, literary aware, I think. Yes, we had the German and my present boss, of course, Lucia Civilotti, who's mm, Italian, Italian but yeah. has no detectable mm -hmm. Italian accent at all. No his grammar. It's impeccable. Mm -hmm. The writing mm -hmm. style is very good. Um, yeah, because there are um, a lot. There are a lot of claims I in neuroscience, and I think this is one of the the, the scourges of neuroscience: uh, is its reputation, uh, representation, and 
also reading your blog has made me more of aware, aware of my own disposition for misrepresentation of data or mis misinterpretation of data, particularly your um, blog on the hazards of significance testing, which was a, a real eye-opener um, for myself. Yes, well, I, I do think it's a mistake to try to run before you can walk, you tend mm -hmm. to fall over. <laughs> <laughs> and it's clear that the brain is quite enormously complicated. There was some while ago a decade of the brain and everyone was saying at the end of ten years we shall understand memory. Well, we don't. <laughs> but the beginning is hardly the beginning of an understanding of how it is. I can remember something that happened to me when I was twenty. Mm -hmm. Not not an inkling. But people don't put it that way. Say this is not uh, entirely clear. They may not have the slightest fucking idea, <laughs> but, but they won't say so. <laughs> and this annoys. This really annoys me. Yeah. Uh, because it's not really honest. Uh, and science, I think, is in danger of being actually harmed by the fact that this, it's so so very competitive. It always has been competitive and there's nothing wrong with com competition in general, but it does lead people to become publicists and hype artists, which is, which is not good. Um, I, I just read a very recent paper from UCL actually, which said that the public is a actually not that interested in neuroscience. And uh, it didn't go on to say that the reason for that is because people think it hasn't really explained much, but I, I think that is probably one of the reasons. I you know, they show you a picture of a beautiful fMRI image. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really tell you what's going on, that's the trouble. And people pretend that it does, which is the worst bit. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the famous red herring experiment, which oh. <laughs> <laughs> debunks a lot of fMRI studies. The dead salmon study. Yeah. yeah it was someone got a a dead salmon from a, a fishmonger and put it in an fMRI machine and got some quite convincing looking <laughs> some images. Yes, it was... I, I, think I mean, it's a start, but the trouble is it is only a start. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a great admirer of Uta Frith among psychologists. Um, she was responsible for a volume that the, Neurosci the, uh, the Royal Society produced about the neuroscience and education and she said the reason this pamphlet was she told me in private <laughs> the, the reason this pamphlet was so slim was because there was very little solid stuff there so there's a great deal of talk but not much is said and yes it's just as Bernard Cantor was saying in 1952 and I think that's the problem for me at least is not that it's not that not much has been explained I think the public could could handle uh, the assertion being told that the brain was too complicated to really understand that quickly but it's the fact that so much is claimed um, or at least alluded to in words that are not so that are non-committal literally taken but sound committal so this research may may lead to a cure for Alzheimer's for example which is the, the, the typical one that I hear because I come from a memory background and, um, so I think the for me, it seems like the public just gets sick of being told stuff that isn't actually happening. Yes, almost everything it seems may cure Alzheimer's. And the trouble is it leads to bad policy. Politicians think that more is known than is not. Mm -hmm. There's this insane thing going on at the moment where Public Health England have are paying doctors to apply tests to patients with dementia. These tests are known not to work in the sense that they produce uh, vast numbers of false positive diagnoses. But they're, being, they're not only being paid to administer them, they're being paid if they get a positive result. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> this is such an incredible misunderstanding of science. It's, it's scarcely possible. And it wasn't. I, I think uh, the person who passes for our Minister of Health at the moment, probably said, I want something dramatic done about Alzheimer's. But instead of them saying, I'm sorry, there's not much we can do about Alzheimer's, they dream up this completely batty 
Now, a screening test, which is utterly without basis and which will do harm. If you test a hundred people and you tell 80 of them that they've got Alzheimer's when they haven't, Mm -hmm. Well, they'd be lucky not to find themselves with lawsuits, I have certain I think you read one case of somebody who was very indignant at being told this. Uh, and quite rightly, too. Mm -hmm. And, and there will be very many more if they persist with it. They simply won't listen. Well, there is quite a, a history of harm being done by um, bad policies. By, yeah, well, by politicians listening to what I to use now the hashtag psycho bollocks <laughs> for on Twitter <laughs> hashtags are a fairly new phenomenon but the, the psycho bollocks are, uh, I think if, um, they're quite old I, I, the, the first example for me was the psychometrists in the 1930s Godfrey Thompson and people and the people who built up the edifice around IQ tests and I think there's a lot of hype about IQ tests. They, they measure your similarity to middle-aged white male psychologists who write <laughs> the test. <laughs> and not everybody wants to be like that. <laughs> uh, but the trouble is, politicians believe the claims that you could stratify people in this way. And the whole post-war system of education, where 75% of the people were written off as dim, 25% went to grammar school was constructed because of these hyped up claims by the, the pre-war psychologists and they had a disastrous social effect and it took, a, it took till the, the next Labour government came along before that was rectified but a, you know, a system which writes off 75% of the population for sick school mm -hmm. cannot be a good idea mm -hmm. and certainly can't be justi justified by the, the tests that were being done. So there's nothing new in, in social harm being done by bad science. Mm -hmm. But the worrying thing is that the bad science was done by scientists. It wasn't you know, politicians, in a sense, are not to blame. They just believe what they were told and they shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. this is, this is a, a terrible admission to have to make. Mm -hmm. Politicians do tend to listen to the scientists that they want to listen to. Though. Well, yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the Conservative government uh, no doubt, like to hear that uh, there's only a handful of bright people, such as me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and the rest could be uh, dealt with much more cheaply. So they, they were probably pre-programmed to like that point of view, but they, they should have had a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. You mentioned... Um, being rewarded, um, being paid um, rather blatantly for positive results uh, in the screening you were talking about earlier. Mm. But w what I would say maybe is more, it is endemic to science now, is being sort of, um, I don't know the right way of this, not overtly, but being paid by, by publications and then subsequent jobs for getting positive results, which I see as a major problem in, in science uh, at present with postdocs and PhDs under such pressure to actually um, publish positive results? Yes, I, I presume that's worse now because of the enormous increase in the number of scientists. Mm -hmm. in, I, I did a two-part degree, there were 15 of us for most of the time, in the first three years, Bachelor of Pharmacy, God help me. And then for the final year, which specialised in pharmacology, there were three of us. <laughs> now we have classes of 100, or in the case of medical students, 300. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, there's a huge number more people needed to teach them. Not that the number has gone up anything like in proportion to the number of students, but uh, it has gone up a lot. Uh, so there's an awful lot of people competing for grant money, far more than there was. Nobody worried when I was young about whether you had a grant or not. They would worry if you didn't produce any publication for ten years, probably, that was about it. And there were people who didn't, but who, they did most of the teaching in the department, and some of them were perfectly good at the teaching. So it all seemed to work quite well, but then, of course, it all got bureaucratised. Mm -hmm. And 
now universities depend on, well, really on subverting grant money <laughs> by creaming some of it off mm -hmm. to run the place. So people are under enormous pressure uh, to get grants, not to do work even. Mm -hmm. uh, in Queen Mary University of London, in King's, and most recently in Warwick, people are being fired, not because they aren't publishing, but because they aren't bringing in enough money. Mm -hmm. So they're saying if your research is cheap to do, that, that's no good. We're not interested in you push off. We only want people to do expensive research because that brings in more money to the university. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly corrupting. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's also short-sighted, I think, because they'll get rid of a lot of the good people. It's often been pointed out that Peter Higgs would certainly have been fired. I would have been fired. Probably Bernard Katz would have been fired if people had been doing this sort of stupid counting business. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, counting papers is stupid. Counting income is even stupider. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is what universities do. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's it's a uh, dreadful and quite corrupting system. And corrupting in the sense that you're under huge pressure to well, get grants and to publish papers. Mm -hmm. The number of papers that are published is now phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of them are not big advances. The, tr the trouble, of course, is that you can't predict which ones will be big advances. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've, I've said that people should perhaps be published, limited to two, two papers a year at the most. I mean, personally, I've never managed more than, more than one, even when the group was at its its uh, peak. A good paper takes three or four years to write. Mm -hmm. If you've got three or four people, then one a year is a good production. But some people don't regard it as such. There's a Catholic imperial knighthood now. It produces 25 papers a year. The 25 papers a year, I doubt he's even read all of them, never mind <laughs> actually written on them, but his name are on them. And that is it's all done by vast slaves swathes of postdocs who never get the push if they don't produce enough. Mm -hmm. And um, this is not a good way to do science in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, and also just because just I wanted to talk about this, because in your st um, hazards of significance testing you suggest that the only sort of safe way to go, um, or at least what I took from it, was to use a significance value of 0 0.001 one or three standard deviations, which is 0 0.0027 or something like that. That's right, yes. Um, <laughs> I would, t if, I, if I even suggested that to most of the bosses that I would have, I may have to delete that, that would be ludicrous because there's, there's just no way that I'd have the time to do that, I don't think. Or, or um, the Well, you haven't got the time because the, your boss is pushing you to produce a paper quickly mm -hmm. when it would have been a better one if it had been produced slowly. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess we've already sort of covered that. It's just pressure coming all the way down from from universities. Yes. yes, this business of significance tests is one on which I've really changed my mind quite a lot. When when I was in my fourth year as an undergraduate, I wrote a paper about um, well the problem of scientific inference, which was pretty amateurish and used to say at that stage, and mm -hmm. not entirely wrong, I don't think. But it was very much from the point of view of null hypothesis testing, where you, this is the, the standard method of doing things, which was devised by usually an uh, eminent statistician, Ronald Fisher, in the 20s and 30s. You say, if there were no effect, then how likely are we to observe results like we have seen or more extreme ones by chance? And if that's a very rare event, then you can say it's assumed and then probably the null hypothesis isn't true and there is a real effect. Uh, and for some reason, which wasn't really Ronald Fisher's proposal, but it's become very established, that if the probability is less than 0.05, then you call that significant. Now, the word significant is utterly arbitrary, mm -hmm. and the 0.05 level is utterly arbitrary. Um, 
trouble is, though, it only dawned on me relatively recently, because we don't actually do so. I never, I never use the word significant in the statistical sense in any paper ever. Mm -hmm. We do parameter estimation, not significance tests, which I don't on the whole trust. Mm -hmm. um, but I never formulated why I don't trust them <laughs> in, in a very accurate way. I, I think the main reason I didn't trust them was because very often it's not random variation that matters in our sort of experiment is systematic errors. You know. and to take a simple example, if a pipette's calibrated wrongly, then of course statistics are no use for discovering that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem though with null hypothesis testing is that it tells you that a result would be rare if there were no real effect. But you need to know really also how rare that event would be if there was a real effect. And that's missed out altogether in the, in, in, in the classical view. And to, to work it out, well, what you need, I think, is the false discovery rate. If you take a particular cutoff between significance and non-significance, it could be point of life, it could be anything. Um, but what you want to know is, of the results you have declared significantly different, how many of them are actually not, how many of them are false positives. Just as in the screening test, you, you want to know of those who come out of the screening test as having cognitive impairment or pre-Alzheimer's, whatever you like to call it, how many of them will actually be ill, how many of them are false positives and won't, won't you know, be ill. And, and this is, I think there's a close analogy actually between the screening test and tests of significance. And if you take that view, you get led to a very different conclusion, um, which, and, and you can show this in at least three different ways, but they all lead to a rather similar conclusion. And that is, if you go through your life declaring you've made a discovery whenever a significance test, a classical significance test, gives you P less than 0.05, then the false discovery rate is at least 30%. People often seem to think it's 5%, but if not, it's at least 30%. And if they're small, so-called underpowered experiments, it could be up to 70%. In a, so, what that's saying is that, yes, it's true that the event you have observed is fairly unlikely if the null hypothesis were true. It's also fairly unlikely if it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. So the actual like, relative likelihood of, of, of it being true and not true is not uh, 20 to 1, it's more like 1 to 1. And that involves a bit of interesting and very old statistics. Bayes' theorem was published, I think, in 1764 um, and has been argued about viciously by statisticians ever since and continues to be, I might say. There's nothing quite so vituperative as a bunch of Bayesians and anti-Bayesians <laughs> <laughs> getting together. <laughs> it, it, it's really quite interesting as a, sort of a semi-outsider on the statistical world to to observe the heated wrangling that still goes on about how you best test whether an experiment um, is a real, a real discovery or mm -hmm. just chance. It sounds like a very simple question. It turns out to be a very complicated one. <laughs> and just from my own experience, um, when stuff is so clearly... I mean, the irreproduci irreproducibility is such a problem, particularly in neuroscience, and the the um, the reason for that is always spouted um, as being just the brain is too complicated. There must be some factor between the two experiments um, that one experimenter did and the other experimenter didn't, and the the the, the then postdocs and PhDs are made to search for what that reason is mm. when really not enough um, weight was given to the, the probability of just an erroneous result in the first place. 
Well, yes, when people publish a result which is false, it wastes a lot of time because people may do other experiments in presuming it, 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 was, it was a correct finding uh, when it wasn't, and then they, of course they waste their time more. They would have to waste time trying to replicate the original mm -hmm. one, finding it, was, it wasn't in fact right. And I think, yes, P equals 0 0.05 or clearly ought to be abolished. It's lousy evidence. It means not I've made a discovery. It means this is interesting. It's maybe worth another look doing the experiment properly this time. <laughs> and it means no more than that. But that's not what the literature is like. It's mm -hmm. full of people saying we've, we've made a big discovery. I, I looked at two papers recently, one from Nature and Neuroscience and one from Science, the American magazine Science, both very high profile journals. They were both things which I looked at really because they hit the newspaper headlines in a big way. Mm -hmm. One's about transcranial magnetic stimulation improving your memory and the other one was about cocoa improving your memory. Well, it wasn't actually about that, that's all the headlines often said. And in each of these cases, both of those cases, when you actually read the paper, you found that the effect on memory was claimed not to be chance because P equals 0.04. Mm. That is just not good evidence. Mm -hmm. It really isn't. It's really pathetic evidence. And the journals do this. I don't know. Uh, the journals obviously don't have very statistically literate referees for a start because these are peer-reviewed papers. And I think they're inclined... The trouble is there's not any competition between science, there's competition between journals as well, not just between individual scientists. And the, the sort of top two, so it said, journals, nature and, and uh, science, are always eager to get the latest sensational scoops mm -hmm. and this relation sensational scoops which are on the wrong thing uh, and uh, I, I think we are now going through a very interesting phase in publishing and I shall certainly not be happy if Elsevier and Nature Publishing Group are out of business by the time it's mm -hmm. on because they're actually doing harm now uh, but people are starting to publish in journals where it's cheap, both for the publisher and which are open to the reader, new ones starting up all the time, which have peer review. The peer review, except in a few specialist areas, is so um, so ineffective. Uh, it was in the case of these, this science paper in the Nature and Neuroscience science one I alluded to. The, uh, the referees evidently hadn't spotted the people's point of for this terrible evidence. Um, what we need is post-publication peer review, and it's, it's happening, and it's working quite well. Th this paper about p-values, which I've eventually got into a, a regular journal, it, it, it's sort of a bit silly, because it's been on my blog, it's had like 25,000 views or something on my blog already. And it's been on archive, the preprint server, which is used mostly by mathematicians and physicists, but this was a, came under the heading of statistics, so I put it there. It's been there since July. And now it's going to come out in a proper journal, but everyone who's sort of interested in it would have read it already. <laughs> <laughs> and at least this Royal Society Open Science Journal, which it's going to appear in, has comments at the bottom. Of course, already been comments on my blog and mm -hmm. email correspondence and so on, which have changed the paper since the first version, and that's very good. It's how things, it's how things will work in the future. I think people, at the moment, there are separate sites like the pub peer where people critique papers, mm -hmm. but it should be below the paper itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is working, and if you look something up in PubMed and there are comments on pub peer, there'll be a link to it now, which is. Fantastic. Good start. And, and, uh, and papers have been retracted because of the comments. They have to be, have to allow anonymous ones, as PubPeer does. 
expect a young person to be critical of some very eminent person who's mm -hmm. probably going to be reviewing his next grant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, apart from a handful of areas like climate change, you don't get a lot of trolls mm -hmm. who are worried about the minutiae mm -hmm. <laughs> of, the, of the opening of an iron channel. I'm not going to get you trolled on that by and large comments which are uh, made anonymously or otherwise can be um, uh, will tend to be quite constructive I think mm -hmm. well, or if they're destructive they may be right <laughs> right they may be rightly destructive I think it's it's, it's a great innovation mm -hmm. and, and it's probably the way we'll be going in the future okay I think I've taken up enough of your time <laughs> thank you very much